Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. Uh, I was a high school science teacher for 15 years. We moved here to Pensacola, Florida, in January of 1989 to put my wife through college at Pensacola Christian College. Soon after moving here, I began writing letters to the editor in the Pensacola News Journal about the subject of creation and evolution. I was very concerned that evolution was being taught in our textbooks as if it's a fact, and it's a far cry from a fact. It's just a bad fairy tale somebody dreamed up years ago. And I want to help straight set the record straight. The Bible is indeed the Word of God. This world is not billions of years old. And so my letters to the editor led to me being invited out to UWF to have a debate on the subject of creation and evolution. I've now been out there nearly 15 times speaking to classes on this subject. Uh, one of the most lively discussions we have is every year I go out to the anthropology class. Dr. Lee, anthropology professor, as you'll see in the video in just a few moments here, Dr. Lee invites me to come every year to unbrainwash his kids after they've learned evolution for four years in a row. Now they're going to have a creationist come in. And this three and a half hour, very lively discussion, I think you'll find quite fascinating on this subject. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming for seven years in a row. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for having me. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Good stuff. It's good to be here. My name is Kent Hovind. I live here in Pensacola. I uh, moved here five years ago to put my wife through school at Pensacola Christian College. I have three teenagers. They go to Pensacola Christian High School. Um, I was a science teacher 15 years and now travel around and speak full-time on this subject, creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. That's my full-time ministry. I speak over 700 times a year. I'm an old-fashioned Bible-believing Christian. I believe the Bible is literally true from cover to cover. And with my science background, it puts a little different slant on things. And so what we're going to share with you today, of course, is the creationist view of how the world got here and some of the things that you've been taught in anthropology class, I would say, of course, are very, very wrong. But it's good to have scientific discussions like this. That's the purpose of an education. See, if you're only shown one side of an issue, you're not being educated, you're being indoctrinated. So an education shows people all the various sides and lets them use their own intellect and decide which one is the most reasonable. I hold without apology to the creationist worldview that this world is too complex. It had to be created by an all-wise, all-powerful creator who is outside of and beyond and above and not affected by his creation. There are really only two opposing worldviews. There is the worldview of evolution. I'm going to draw it like so, and I'm going to make three columns to, uh, for this discussion here. We'll take questions all along the way. You can stop me at any time and say, no, wait a minute, I disagree with that, and we'll discuss it. But uh, I do have uh, plenty of opportunities to speak on this. I do numerous debates uh, at universities. I've had three here so far at University of West Florida. And I appreciate the academic uh, atmosphere where they allow me to come in. Uh, I speak many times in public schools. I was in six this week already. I speak very frequently in public schools. And I think students need to see all sides of this issue. What we've had for the last 30 years particularly, though, is the creationist worldview has been totally censored out of our textbooks. I collect the public school textbooks. I have just nearly all of them from science textbooks from all the major publishers for many years. And the evolutionist frame of mind or worldview is the only one that is promoted in the textbooks. Now, of course, we have many teachers who treat the subject very fairly, but the textbooks have become increasingly one-sided. We're going to make three columns. There are some facts. And then there are different ways to interpret the fact. Sometimes two people can look at the very same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they're seeing. The story is told about the uh, farmer who was out pulling a calf one time. Anybody raised on a farm here? Any farm kids? A calf puller is a long pole with a block and tackle on it or a, a come along on it. And in case the cow has a hard time having a calf, you hook a rope around the calf's leg and you <coughs> winch it out of the cow. Help the cow out a little bit. Well, this farmer was out there pulling a calf and this city fella stopped to just stopped his car to see what's going on. He'd never seen anything like this before in his life. And the farmer said, come here, man, give me some help, would you? And the city fellow said, me? He said, yeah, come here. He said, I don't know nothing about this. He said, come on, I need some help now. So the city fellow hopped out of his car, jumped the fence, ran over there and helped the farmer pull the calf. Never said a word. Just did what the farmer told him, you know, hold this, pull this. About 10 minutes later, they're walking up to the barn to get washed up. And the uh, city fellow said, uh, or the far farmer said, Man, you've been awful quiet. Are you okay? He said, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. The farmer said, uh, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city fellow said, no, sir, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. And the farmer said, well, you got any questions? He said, oh, yes, I do. I have one question. been bugging me the whole time we're out there. The farmer said, uh, let's hear it. 
The city fellow said, uh, how fast do you think that calf was going when it ran into that cow? <laughs> no, no, you're looking at it all wrong. We are not separating the collision here. Uh, see, two people can look at the same thing and come to very opposite conclusions. I'll give you an example. It's a fact. Grand Canyon exists. I don't think you'd find too many folks that would disagree with that. Of course, there's always a few on the lunatic fringe who would say, no, we're not really here. We just think we're here. There is no such thing as reality, okay? We're going to discount those folks for today's discussion. There are really only two options, okay, to a lot of these questions we're going to raise today. Grand Canyon is there. It's a big crack in the ground. I have seen it from numerous angles. There is no question it's there. Now, there are several ways to interpret how it got there. The evolutionist interpretation... The evolutionist interpretation says it took a little bit of water millions of years. That's called uniformitarian geology. How many are familiar with that word, uniformitarian? The way it's happening today is the way it has always happened. Charles Lyell was the champion of uniformitarianism back in his book, 1831, Principles of Geology, Volume 1. Charles Lyell really taught and introduced into the public arena the idea of uniformitarianism. There is another worldview which is the creationist worldview. The creationist worldview says it took a lot of water a little bit of time. <coughs> Lots of water a short time. You see, while the mud was soft, and Grand Canyon is obviously all composed of sedimentary rock, so it was all sedimentary rock mud at one time before it turned to rock. There's nobody would argue that question. That's how sedimentary rock is formed. The creationist would say a lot of water formed Grand Canyon in just a matter of a few hours or a few days, not millions of years. The fact is the canyon is there. Now, how are you going to interpret that fact? Some people tend to confuse the interpretation with the fact, and that's where you have to really watch that you don't get caught in that trap. What we're going to share now is just the creationist worldview opinion of how it may have happened. None of us were there. That's obvious. So we have to then go on the facts that we can find and try to interpret, make up a model that'll work, and say, okay, this is maybe how it happened. The creationist worldview. I believe that the world is only six to seven, maybe 10,000 years old maximum. It cannot be any older than that. I'm going to say six to 10,000. So I'm going to draw a timeline. Right here is the present. We're going to call it the year 2000, since we're getting close to that, just for the sake of marking it off in thousands. We go back to the year zero, where we figure our calendar from, when Christ was born. Actually, our calendar is a few years off. I'm familiar with all that Gregorian calendar and everything. And then we go back to B.C., times before Christ. We have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 B.C., 4,000 years before Christ. According to the dates given in the Bible, if you add up the dates given in the Bible, Adam was 130 when Seth was born, and Seth was 105 when Enos was born, and the dates are all spelled out in Genesis chapter 5, and in chapter 11, and in several other places throughout Scripture, the dates are given of how old they were when their children were born. Adding up those dates will give an approximate age of the creation of the world of about 4,000 B.C., plus or minus several hundred, maybe 500 or so allowances for genealogy um, overlapping and things like that. If the, we're we're going to use the word 4,000, but don't hold me to that, okay? I'm not one of those guys that says Adam was created 4,004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon, okay? I, knew, I do know Adam was created in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. That's the only clue we have in Scripture. But it doesn't give the exact date. All right, so we're going to, about 4,000 years ago. Then the Bible says, 1,600 years later, <coughs> there was a worldwide flood. A flood that destroyed the world. This took place about... 1,600 years after the creation. Actually, 1656, if the dates given are exactly correct. After this flood, there were only eight survivors, eight people on board that ark. Those eight people began producing a population. They, had lived, they lived longer, so they had more children, maybe 10 or 15 kids per family. Population began to grow pretty rapidly. And by the time you got to the year zero, the time of Jesus Christ, the world population, and anybody would agree with this that studied the population statistics of the world, the world population was approximately one-fourth of a billion. One quarter billion, 250 million, is the approximate world population at the time of Christ. You can go upstairs to your library or to the next building over here and get the 
uh, population statistics, uh, Macmillan Encyclopedia, or look it up in any one you want that deals with the population issue. Most experts agree the whole world population 2,000 years ago was approximately a quarter billion, 250 million. Then the population began to grow, especially around the 1600s when a lot of new uh, medical advancements came on the scene and a lot of really, really modern science began about the 1600s. That's where there was a great, of course, revival in reading the Bible. The King James Version was translated, and many versions were put into the English language or into the common people's language where people could read it for themselves. And I think that was one of the great causes of the great revival of interest in learning and knowledge. And along with that came some tremendous medical advancements and scientific advancements and technology advancements. And so people began living longer, producing more children, and children lived longer. And the, about 1600 is when the population began to skyrocket. 1800, there were one billion people in the world. In 1800, we crossed the one billion mark. In 1930, it crossed the two billion mark. 1930. Today it's up over five billion, but really all of the population growth has come in the last couple of hundred years. So it is very possible that the whole world's population started 4,400 years ago with eight people. Anybody familiar with population growth rates, logarithmic extrapolation, could tell you, yes, the whole world's population, six billion, could have easily started only four or five thousand years ago. Now the evolutionist interpretation of, it's a fact, we have about, I'm going to say five and a half billion people in the world. We'll put that in the fact column. Nobody argues with that. I mean, that's not an exact number, but it's close enough. Well, how do you interpret that? The evolutionist says the population stayed at 50,000 or so for many, many, many thousands of years, several million years. There were just a few thousand people in the world, or subhumans. And then they would agree from about the time, about 1,000 B.C. on, they would agree with the population growth curve that the creationist would give to it. These are established facts. But the evolutionist has this line going along at 30 or 40, 50,000 for 3 million years. And populations simply don't grow like that. They're just an automatic blast off, just like putting money in the bank. Once you reach a certain number of dollars in the bank, the compounded interest starts to take over. So the creationist interpretation is no problem. The fact that we have 5.5 billion really fits fine into the biblical chronology of starting 4,400 years ago with eight people getting off an ark. <coughs> The evolutionist would also say, no problem, but he would have to say that this population was steady for millions of years. So if you look at the facts, neither one it can be discounted based on the fact that we have a population. If you're willing to admit a worldwide flood in Noah's day, then the formation of Grand Canyon and Carlsbad Caverns and the Snake River Valley and all those canyon formations are really no problem for the creationist. Somebody, if a teacher says, well, millions of years ago, the first question ought to come into your mind is, uh, excuse me, were you there? You know, do you know it's millions or billions of years old? Time is something, I mean, it's gone, okay? It's historical. We can't really have scientific data. We must have historical data. And it becomes a very different way to interpret it. I believe when God created the heavens and the earth, everything, about six or 7,000 years ago, everything was very perfect. Perfect world, completely done. Poof, he spoke and it was done in six literal 24-hour days. And during that time, everything lived together, including the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived with man. They were just big, friendly lizards in the Garden of Eden. See, the unusual thing about lizards, if you've had your biology classes, you know that lizards and many reptiles never stop growing. They never stop. When I moved into my house across the street from Pensacola Christian High School two years ago, I was going around meeting all my neighbors, knocking on doors, finding out who the neighbors were, and like everybody ought to do in the neighborhood, be friendly, you know, and I knocked on this house, six doors down from my house, and the guy said, come on in. Well, I walked in, and there, crawling around loose on his kitchen floor, right in front of me, was a five-foot-long iguana. This guy raises iguanas for pet stores, five foot long. I stopped, held perfectly still. I said, does it bite? He said, no, no, we just fed it. I said, how big is that thing going to get? He said, it's an iguana, man. They never stop growing. He said, I've raised them ten feet long before. Lizards never stop growing. So... The creationist would say, dinosaurs lived in the pre-flood era for about 1,600 years. They were just simply giant lizards. The Bible teaches, and of course it's not scientifically provable because it's gone now, the Bible teaches that the original earth, when God first made it, had a canopy of water above the atmosphere. The air that we're breathing today has about six layers to it, troposphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer, according to scripture. The seventh layer was a layer of water 
above the atmosphere. May some kind of cloud cover. Venus has a dense cloud cover. Jupiter has a dense cloud cover. The Earth apparently had a dense, I don't know about dense, but had some kind of water above the atmosphere, which would do several things. It would filter out the harmful effects of the sun. Most of the aging process is caused by the sun, especially ultraviolet light and uh, x-rays that are destroying your body, and your body has to constantly battle against those damaging effects of the sunlight. The original creation did not have that. According to scripture, they were protected by a canopy of water, which many creationists think would have increased air pressure. It's interesting, some of the articles out now about what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, International Falls, Minnesota, the Daily Journal. New theory, lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs from the Boston Associated Press. Studies of dinosaurs indicate they had very small lungs compared to their body size. Also, they had very small nostrils. The nostrils of a Brachiosaurus were about the same size as those in a horse. So how's a critter that big, 150 feet now is the world's record, how's he going to get enough oxygen to survive? Well, in today's atmosphere, a 150-foot dinosaur could not survive. He couldn't get enough oxygen to maintain body metabolism. But if the pre-flood scenario is correct, that before the flood there was a canopy of water, this would increase air pressure, meaning every time you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen. Not only that, the pre-flood world apparently had richer oxygen to begin with. They drill into the ancient uh, samples of amber and find air bubbles in there. Trapped amber, or amber that traps air bubbles, when you analyze the air bubbles, this is from Time Magazine, 1987, page 82, also Science Magazine, 1987, November, page 890, tells about the sampling of the air found in amber. It indicates 50% more oxygen than we had today. So instead of 20% oxygen, they had 30% oxygen. Well, these are a couple of scientific facts that really would fit fine with the creationist worldview. The original Earth had a little richer oxygen and higher pressure. The strange thing about high pressure gases is when you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen per lungful, and your healing process is much faster. Many major hospitals today are putting in what's called hyperbaric chambers. Little Jessica McClure, the girl in Texas that fell down in the well, remember that, 1987? Her foot was twisted around and stuck in her face as she was down inside of a 12-inch pipe for over two days, 58 and a half hours. When they got her out, her foot was completely black, and part of her leg was black from lack of circulation. They were going to cut her foot off, but one of the doctors suggested that they try her in a hyperbaric chamber. They put Jessica in a big steel chamber, pumped it up full of pure oxygen, and put it up to 30 pounds per square inch. Today you're breathing about 14.7 pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure. At 30 pounds per square inch, Jessica's foot began to turn pink within a few hours. It forced oxygen into the tissue. And they finally had to cut off the tip of her little toe. That's the only thing that wouldn't respond. She would have lost her whole foot. And many major hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers because they are learning that high pressure oxygen causes the healing process to go many times faster than normal. A lot of burn patients are put in hyperbaric chambers these days because they heal so much faster. The Bible account would indicate that the whole world had these conditions. And so in pre-flood conditions, the people actually lived over 900 years. And there are many accounts, besides the Bible, many ancient accounts in literature that tell of a time when ancient people lived many, many hundreds of years. And that certainly is biologically possible if you could alter not only the atmosphere that you're breathing, but also the plants would be getting more, uh, better growth rate and have more nutrition to the plants. The people apparently, according to scripture at least, lived over 900 years. Here is a chart that I made of the length of the people's lifespans. Adam, for instance, every notch is 100 years here. Adam, according to scripture, lived over 900 years. His son Seth lived over 900 years. Right here, this black line going down is the flood, 1,600 years later. These are straight from the dates given in the Bible. The people before the flood lived over 900 years, with one or two exceptions. After the flood, lifespans dropped off to 400 years, and then down to 200 years. Something changed because of that flood. Well, the creationist worldview would say, this canopy of water fell down. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. It flooded the world. It was a worldwide total catastrophe for this place. Everything was covered. All the mountains simultaneously covered at one time. People say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it possible to flood the world? Is, I mean, could it rain enough to flood the whole world? 
Well, today, absolutely not. No, no, there's only enough moisture in the atmosphere to rain about two inches. But there's enough water in the ocean to cover this world two miles deep right now. If the world were smoothed out, if you push the mountains down and lift the ocean basins up, if you equalize things, the water would be 12,000 feet deep over the entire world. Well, the Bible indicates that after this flood, or actually during the course of the flood, in the last few months of the flood, the Bible says the mountains arose. The earth's crust was twilt, uh, crinkling in under the pressures of all this water and the great catastrophe that it was under, and the mountains lifted up and the ocean sank down during the last few months of that flood. As the mountains lifted up, the water would run off into the hole on the way, forming Grand Canyon in a matter of a few hours because you had many, many thousands of feet of soft sediment. During that flood, all sorts of animals drowned, and people. Their bodies would then be, those that drowned, some would float and would rot and would not be preserved as fossils because they floated around. Some would happen to get buried. Those animals that are near the bottom already, like clams, would be buried first because they're already at the bottom. If there's a mudslide or volcanoes going on, they would be the first ones buried. The animals like birds and man are the last ones to drown. Because man could figure out a way to avoid drowning until the last possible minute. And birds, of course, can fly around until they run out of gas. And then when they do die, their wings are hollow and their bones are hollow, so they would float. Then the reason we tend to find birds on top of the so-called geologic column might be better explained because of a worldwide flood. It doesn't necessarily have to be that birds evolve last. There are two ways to interpret that. You know, how fast is that calf going when it ran into that cow anyway? You might want to keep track of the idea that maybe there is another very reasonable alternative explanation for some of the data that we see. I'm in favor of science. I love science. I got a PhD in education, which stands for post hole digger, by the way. But I love science. But I'm afraid the evolutionist worldview is only one option. And as you go here to the University of West Florida, that's generally all you're going to be shown in your textbooks. The author of this textbook, as I read the older edition of this, doesn't consider creationism other than to ridicule it. Oh, this is an old-fashioned idea. We proved this wrong a hundred years ago. That's the attitude they give about creation. Well, the creationist worldview would say, because of this flood, all of the geologic features were formed. After the flood, the climate was very, very different. The people didn't live as long, and any time you change atmospheric pressure, like that flood would have done, you would have some real changes, really, for the next few hundred years as the globe, uh, Earth began to restabilize. The ice caps were advancing and retreating as things were very unstable ecologically, and the climatology was very different. And so with increased um, weather changing patterns, people began to be deficient in certain diseases. Most of the ancient skulls that you've been shown, like uh, Homo erectus and you know, uh, Neanderthal man, were probably just people who were deficient in certain vitamins, rickets or uh, Different diseases would set in under climate conditions like that where they weren't able to get enough sunshine. And rickets does cause the br brow ridge to thicken and enlarge, and, uh, enlarge, and it causes the bone structure to be altered. There's a great book out, which you really ought to read, and I tried to order enough for everybody, but they're totally out of print. But if you would like one, I will buy you one if you'll promise to read it. Bones of Contention. This is by a creationist who has studied every single so-called fossil of caveman or ape man and has given a creationist interpretation of that. So if you'd see my son afterwards over there and put your name on the list, I will buy you one if you'll promise to read it. I don't, want, I don't have enough money to buy everybody a book to sit on your shelf. But if you really want an education, you ought to see both sides. If you like what you believe because whatever reason, well, then you may not want to see the other side. But there is an awful lot of evidence that says these so-called cavemen, Neanderthal man, Piltdown man, Java man, Peking man, etc., etc., are either... Um, misidentified little fragments or they are simply deformed humans from certain things. You could line up the skulls of folks in this county in the same sequence that they appear in your anthropology books. There are folks with the same deformations of their skulls. So that, that lining up bones in a certain order does not prove that's the way it evolved. Yes, sir? Why were why are the bones that have been found only when I quote sickened bones? Why don't we have a fine array of healthy bones from the these people too. All right. Here is some charts that I photocopied from this book uh, of the different so-called, like for instance, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and the dates that they were assigned. You got to understand there is a 
there is a preconceived idea that is very well established called the geologic column the time scale by the evolutionist you know so certain things happen and it's a very it's a preconceived idea and if a fossil is found it must fit into that pattern or the time is rejected many of the fossils that have been found have they have said well this is fully human but it's too old there's archaic homo sapien species that don't fit pure hundred percent normal natural homo sapien bones have been found just like today's bones in layers that are supposedly two million years old so all sorts of mental gymnastics must be done if you want to preserve the theory the interpretation if you're just willing to look at the facts you would have to say hey if, if this bone is two million years old then all these other things don't matter they can't be human ancestors and I've got enough of these to pass out to everybody we'll do this at the end in just a second homo erectus homo habilis uh, should be another page of these, bud. Oh, here. Um, I thought, yeah, here they are. Okay, two separate ones. No, that's something else. Hmm. Can I go check the back of the van and see if there's another set of these things that I photocopied? Would you please? Oh. So, I think very few human fossils are found. Period. There are probably only four thousand human fossils or humanoid fossils found in the entire world. That's a reasonable figure. Um, to me, the explanation of that would be, when God first made the world, it was full of animals and full of plants, but only two people. They then had to populate the world, and in 1,600 years, there were only several million, maybe a billion, I don't know, but not near the population we have today. So human bones would be rare for two reasons. Number one, there weren't as many humans as there were animals. Number two, humans are going to figure out a way to avoid drowning until the last minute, which puts them on top and they rot. They're not preserved at all. So the fact that we only have 4,000 or so is n no problem for me. Now how they're dated, well, all that kind of stuff, carbon dating, we'll get into that in just a little bit. After this flood, though, I believe man began killing off the dinosaurs. <clears throat> See, man well, the climate killed off many of them because climate was different and they couldn't grow as big and live as long. But man began hunting them, and that's why during this era from 4,000 years ago, we have many stories of people killing dragons. There are many legends like that of dragon slayers. The Chinese recipes from the 3,000 years ago call for dragon bones ground up in the recipes, dragon saliva, dragon fat, you know, for all kinds of different so-called recipes or medicines. <coughs> Is it all just mythology? I mean, they were there, we weren't. If you have an evolutionary perspective, a worldview, you have to give all of the so-called dragon stories the interpretation of mythology. If you have a creationist worldview, that would really make sense that dinosaurs may have lived with man for a thousand years or so after the flood. They were getting smaller, they were getting more rare, and they were being hunted to the point of even total extinction in many areas. Then you come up into the present, and there are still many thousands of reports coming out of places around the world of dinosaurs that may still be living. For instance, Loch Ness Monster. There's been hoaxes and frauds, no question, but there have been 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. And if you show this dinosaur, a plesiosaurus, to anybody who has seen the Loch Ness Monster, they will say, that's it. That's what I saw right there. Well, now, there's no question. Some may be trying to get tourist dollars over there in, you know, Scotland and all that. I've not been there. I do have a map of Loch Ness right here from Scotland with some of the pictures that have been taken of the Loch Ness Monster and an underwater topography of the, of the area. The lake is 900 <coughs> to 1,000 feet deep. And there have been some very <coughs> reputable people with nothing to gain but ridicule who have said, I have seen it. So I have spent many years, not out there, but I have spent many years collecting data, believe it or not, on dinosaurs that may still be alive. Now, they're not nearly as big, and they're certainly not anywhere in Pensacola, Florida that I know of. You know, it's not, it's not like they're all over the world. But you really can't prove the extinction of anything. And think about that for a minute. You can't prove anything is extinct because you cannot be all places at all times to examine the whole world simultaneously. There are some who are saying there may be a few dodo birds left on some of these Pacific Islands. I don't know. That, you know they haven't been seen in 300 years, but how can you prove there aren't any? So proving extinction is, a, is an impossible thing to do. There are those who are saying that there could be a few dinosaurs still left. If you watch programs like Unsolved Mysteries or Sightings or things like that, you see some awfully bizarre things on there that don't make sense if you have this worldview because you've already been taught. Dinosaurs died out 70 million years ago. Don't dare question that or you'll be excommunicated from the temples of higher...